Hello and welcome to Politics in the Pulpit, a uh, preaching resource from the Joint Public Issues team, exploring the lectionary text for this coming Sunday and asking the questions of how and whether politics should appear in our preaching this week. My name is David Main. I'm a Baptist minister based in Essex and I'm pleased to be hosting this season of the podcast. Each week, I'm joined by a guest from a different place and space on the pulpit and political landscape. And today, we have a, a special treat for you all today. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Paul uh, Boateng, the Right Honourable Lord Boateng, PCDL, who was born in Britain but brought up in Ghana. Uh, Paul's a civil liberties lawyer, a former member of parliament and cabinet minister, the first uh, black cabinet minister in the UK and then served as Her Majesty's High Commissioner to South Africa from 2005 to 2010. Paul's a Methodist lay preacher, a former vice moderator in the World Council of Churches, is moderator emeritus of the Bible Society's African Biblical Leadership Initiative, and currently chairs the Church of England Archbishop's Commission on Racial Justice. Paul, welcome. Thank you very much, David. It's great to have you with us on the podcast today. Um, so what are some of the, well, I'm guessing politics and the pulpit are almost an inescapable combination for someone with your CV. Would that be fair to say? No, I mean, I really, I came to bear witness uh, which is how I see my presence in the pulpit. I mean, I, we as Christians are called upon to be present in many places, uh, at work, uh, in the home, in the community, uh, and sometimes uh, in, in pulpits. Uh, it uh, comes as a calling. Uh, and for me, that calling didn't come when I was a politician. Indeed, it came sometime before. I was uh, a lawyer, a community lawyer, in North London, Northwest London, and I came to know a remarkable man called Vic Watson, who was the superintendent minister of the Fernhead Road Methodist Church. And we got talking, and he really challenged me in many ways. But one of the ways in which he challenged me was to be prepared to witness to the role that Christ had played in my life, was playing in my, my work. And I came to Methodism and to being a lay preacher through, through him. And I have no involvement in politics at that time, no formal involvement. I was a member of a political party, but first and foremost, uh, I was a, a lawyer, and it is my experience as a lawyer, uh, as a young man growing up in both Ghana and Britain, uh, as a politician. It's my life's experience, and the way that Christ has impacted and what I've seen in that life that I bring to the pulpit, not politics. Okay, I love that. And I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about your role with the Archbishop's Commission on, on Racial Justice. What, what's that involving for you at the moment? Well, at the moment, it's very new. Uh, I was appointed, what, uh, four, five, uh, five, six weeks ago. Uh, and the Church of England is reflecting, uh, as many, as many uh, institutions in our society are doing, uh, on institutional racism, on its history, on its calling, uh, and addressing uh, racism is part and parcel of that. And I've been asked to, um, to lead a, a commission in getting alongside the church in that process, challenging uh, the, the church, uh, and engaging so that we can truly manifests God's love to to all people and without the barriers that bigotry racism and a checkered history on that subject 
can throw up to being witnesses to the universality of his love. Our Lord came for us all, Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, man, woman, uh, whatever uh, and, and however we manifest our identity, we find one identity in the love of Jesus Christ. And in addition to work on, on racial uh, justice, are there, are there other big justice issues that, that loom on your radar at the moment? Well, look, I mean, I think for all of us in our lives, um, if we are seeking to bring ourselves closer to our Lord and to his vision of the coming uh, of, uh, of the kingdom, we confront in our working lives a range of issues that center around his justice. And I'm a, I'm a banker in one part of my life. In another, uh, I head up a uh, development utility, water and sanitation for the urban poor. In my political life, uh, I'm a member of the International Relations and Defense Committee uh, of uh, the House of Lords. Now, in all those things, whether it is finance for the environment, whether or not it is uh, providing uh, water, that most essential element uh, to those who would otherwise not have access to it in, uh, because of uh, poverty, because uh, of uh, urban uh, uh, deprivation, or whether it's because, or, or whether in the field of international relations, uh, we are living with the consequences of the aftermath of Afghanistan, uh, of uh, Soviet uh, incursions uh, into uh, uh, previous Soviet Union, now Russian incursions uh, into, uh, into Georgia. All those things are, are justice issues uh, because what our Lord has, has said and what he, he demonstrates uh, is the need for us to so order our lives that people are not excluded uh, through uh, poverty, that people are not uh, subjugated uh, through uh, 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 war uh, and the threat uh, of war uh, and, and violence, uh, so that uh, people are at one with the totality of his creation. So climate change uh, threatens the integrity uh, of Christ's creation. So we have to find ways, don't we, uh, through finance, through the way we conduct every aspect uh, of our lives to, to address those, those issues. So life isn't about little compartments, one labeled justice, uh, the, other, the other labeled uh, uh, development, the other labeled personal development, the other labeled uh, economic economics. It's not, it's not like that. Uh, Christ calls us to be whole in every aspect of our lives, and that includes uh, the lives of work and, and politics. Which leads rather neatly uh, onto uh, e the email that I received this week from our friends at uh, JPIT HQ. Uh, each week they send me a list of some of the uh, more significant justice issues in the news that also set a context to our preaching for this week. And and top of that list is is COP. Um, and after a number of announcements last week, uh, more of the heavy negotiating is to be done uh, this week with uh, issues on climate finance and carbon pricing and the crucial issue of accountability. Uh, how will we stop this becoming uh, just rhetoric? And how will we call people to account? Um, there's obviously the ongoing tensions between the UK and the EU. Um, uh, particularly centering on Northern Ireland and fishing. There's the escalating conflict in Ethiopia. 
uh, this Sunday is Remembrance Sunday. And then perhaps the story that's had the most column inches in recent days, the ministerial standards story, uh, lobbying, second jobs, expenses, all these things being discussed. I mean, you would have been in Parliament, Paul, uh, in the late 90s um, when cash for questions was a thing. Um, I think you uh, uh, not 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 around for the MPs' expenses explosion uh, just before the 2010 election. Um, but is that reverberating where where you are? Well, uh, I'm in the House of Lords. I'm in the Palace of Westminster as I speak. So of course it's uh, reverberating. Of course, one is concerned that anything that uh, undermines uh, the uh, the role uh, of Parliament and parliamentarians and the the assault on trust which uh, these events represent, the trust of people in their institutions, in their politicians, anything that does that has to be a cause of concern. But I think, you know, what we have to do uh, is to look at our society, uh, look uh, at our institutions uh, and ask how we, how we make them better fit for purpose, how we attract um, more people into engagement with the political process. And when that process appears to be working on the basis of self-interest and interests of a commercial uh, nature over and above the interests of the people, it's very hard to attract people into something that they see as sleazy, unsavory. Uh, but equally, it's hard to attract people into uh, politics when they face a bar when politicians face uh, a barrage of abuse, insults, and threats, uh, not least on on social uh, media, and a distortion of their role and of their motives, because most people of all parties go into politics because they want to make a difference, uh, because they want uh, to be part and parcel of something that makes life better for people. That's why most people uh, go into, into politics. Now, there are undoubtedly a, a number who fall by the wayside. There are undoubtedly a number who succumb uh, to a variety uh, of temptations and the abuse of power. But that really shouldn't uh, cause us to doubt the importance of engaging in the world of public uh, policy, engaging in the world of representative um, democracy. Uh, and it will be a terrible tragedy if uh, these events put people off politics, because there's a lot that is good and a lot that is worthwhile in a political life. I was very struck over the weekend hearing from some members of parliament sharing how they themselves haven't been implicated in anything. They themselves weren't even in the relevant political party for the news at the moment, but how they had received abuse from people who see this as a plague on everybody's house, you know, and it just affects the climate in which our politics occurs. All the more reason for Parliament to get a grip and to sort this out. But, you know, for Christians in Parliament, and we have a very strong Christian fellowship across parties in the Palace of Westminster. Um, it's very important to know, know that we are part of a wider community of prayer. Prayer is actually hugely important. Uh, and I just hope uh, that uh, we will pray more together uh, for a better politics, a kinder politics, a more engaging and open and inclusive politics than we have uh, at the moment. But Christians have a, have a role to play 
in that on all sides uh, and there's a need for, for prayer and we need uh, as politicians we need the prayers of those outside the palace of westminster and we pray together ourselves within the palace of westminster but then you know david um we're not alone uh, you know uh, i just think uh, if you look at every aspect of our society today um, and not just in Britain, but globally. There is mistrust, there is doubt, there is apathy, there is indifference, uh, there is disengagement, and we have to address that. And Christians have a role in addressing that. Yes, very much so, very much so. And then j uh, one of the key hopes that j outlines is for a, a kind of politics. Okay, so we turn now to uh, our lectionary text for the week. Uh, we've got a text from 1 Samuel 1 and then Hebrews 10 and then Mark 13. Um, Paul, have you got any preference? Where would you like to start? Well, I, I think let's go straight to it. Let's go to Mark. Okay. So we've been working through Mark's gospel with the lectionary for a little while. Um, and we've got chapter 13, verses 1 to 8. A very interesting section because as it begins, very much the temple being left behind. Um, I was very struck actually talking to you today, conscious of where you are and um, the disciples respond here um, in verse one that they're, they're impressed by their surroundings and the awe and they almost um, how easy it is in the presence of something that's awe inspiring to, to forget what you're about. And uh, it struck me that I wonder if the Palace of Westminster can have that impact on people, too. I think uh, the beauty and the antiquity of the Palace of Westminster uh, is always for me a reminder of the importance of this place and of the responsibility we who are privileged to work in it bear. I remember when I was a, a very young MP, first time in the House in 1987. Um, very low down on the pecking order, a new boy. Um, and before we all had offices, I mean, now every MP gets an office of their own. But in 1987, that wasn't the case. And it was made very clear to me that I wasn't going to get an office of my own. And I was asked, well, you know, where do you want to go then? So I said, as near the chamber as possible, because I was conscious that I had a lot of learning to do. I wanted to spend time there. Uh, and I got allocated um, a desk in a corridor okay. with seven other MPs of all parties. <laughs> and uh, that's where we were. And you had a desk and a phone and a filing cabinet. And that was it. But the great thing about this corridor was that it was off the Great Hall in Westminster. Oh, okay. And this is, you know, this was built in Norman times. Mm -hmm. It's the same uh, oak beams, the same stones that have been there since 1099. And, you know, it was just so awe-inspiring and focusing, really, to get it to come into work every morning and to pass into that little corridor where my desk was through this great space that was designed to provoke shock uh, and and awe and for me still actually does when i think of all the things that have gone on there mm. all that it has seen but of course what we are told in mark is that we have to put all these things into perspective that they're all transitory that uh, it it doesn't last nothing actually lasts uh, everything is actually there by the grace of God, and it will pass. 
you know, however beautiful and mighty uh, and uh, and unassailable it seems, it's nothing uh, compared to the power and might uh, of uh, uh, of God. Uh, and the great things will fall and do fall. And our Lord foretells uh, the destruction of the temple. And indeed it was destroyed. So we mustn't put our, our faith and our hope in the tangible. Uh, we mustn't be deceived by appearances. Uh, all things pass. The only certainty, the only certainties are, are his coming and his love. And we exist in one sense in the end of days because we are between his first coming uh, and the new dispensation that followed and his second. Uh, and that's how we find ourselves, that's how we are positioned. Uh, and we need to make the most of it. We need to read the signs of the time. Mm. Uh, we need to understand what's going on around us, but we need to understand that we have, we have in God uh, our, our strength and our comforter, and that bad stuff happens, will happen, will always happen till the till uh, his coming. Uh, but we can find a way through that, uh, through the power uh, of of his love. Uh, and that's a that's a wonderful message. That is the good news to me. Mm. And I think as Jesus encourages them to to discern uh, in the in these days, I, I wonder what. What are some of the things that help you when you're trying to discern um, what's good and what's not good? Um, is it kind of an instinctive thing or um, how, how do we navigate that space? Uh, for me, um, there's no getting away from the word. You know, this is the word of God. Uh, and there's no getting away from it, and nor should we want to, uh, because it is through Scripture that we get a sense of his life, of Jesus. And I think we have to put Jesus and the life of Jesus at the heart of everything. Uh, and therefore, for me, this is, this is the beginning. This is the Alpha and the Omega. Having, having said that, of course, you know, we're human uh, and uh, people matter uh, and people's lives matter and we can learn from them. You know, uh, this is the importance uh, of the saints in our church tradition. This is the importance of holy women uh, and and men. This is the importance of people whose lives are exemplary in one way or the other, or exemplary in part, if not in totality, because we are human. And therefore, throughout my life, there have been women and men uh, who have been important to me and important to my own spiritual growth and my capacity to, to discern. And then above all, and, and those relationships are, are, are important, but the most important relationship, so this is the third thing, is our Lord Jesus, our God, who we approach through, in my case, prayer. Uh, and that is, that is the way that I find to him uh, through, and I come to him through prayer. And all of those things help in the process of discernment, in making your way through the, uh, the thicket and the undergrowth uh, of life. 
which leads very neatly, if I may say, to the reading, I think, from Hebrews today. So it's Hebrews 10, 11 to 14. And then picking up again at 19 to 25. Um, where it talks about the, the significance of Christ's sacrifice, the all-encompassing nature um, of his priesthood. Um, and then going on in, in 19, therefore, uh, sisters and brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Christ, and then encouraging us to persevere and hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess um it's really it's a bringing us back to christ as the center of all that we do and his sacrifice uh, on on the cross uh, i mean i'm and through that sacrifice through his giving of his blood uh, through his suffering as a man because of course you know, that's the that's the critical thing he chooses to become human for us and to suffer the agonies of the cross uh, when he didn't have to or when he might not have done but he chose to do that for for us um and therefore you know all the all the sort of all the past things, all the stuff about burnt offerings, all that. Well, none of that actually. If that's all past now, it's the blood sacrifice that we commemorate in in communion. It's that sacrifice that turns the cross from an instrument of torture into a symbol of our and death, into a symbol of our liberation and. And eternal life and that's why for me communion is so important and I think one of the most difficult things about lockdown uh, was not being able uh, to, uh, to to share uh, with one another in in Holy Communion in the way uh, which uh, we had grown used to and of course, what it's done, of course, is to mean that we can no longer really take it for granted in the way perhaps that we that we did. But that that communion is very, very important indeed, because it's the reminder you know, time and time again. And we need reminding. He gave his life for us. But that was wonderful picture, isn't there? Uh, and they had it. They had a. a in the national, it's in the national gallery. If my memory serves me well, but certainly, it was there when when, when they had a uh, an exhibition of religious um, paintings, and there's this wonderful picture um, by an Italian artist whose name I can never pronounce properly. It begins with Z. Uh, of of a lamb, just the lamb, the lamb of God. And the thing about this picture is it's the way uh, there's total sort of relaxation, total submission. He's just, the body is, is just there. This is total innocence. Uh, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice that was made for, for us and which cleanses us uh, of, all our, of all our sin, that makes us whole. Uh, through through that blood sacrifice so central central to our to our faith mm. and if we might turn then to our old testament reading for a few moments we are in one samuel where we've not been um, yet uh, on the, the lectionary we've uh, you've you've been spared job uh, and we've done ruth for a few weeks and now we're into samuel and from verse four through to verse 20 um which where we have hannah um going to the temple 
Um, how do you uh, feel when uh, you're you're down to preach and you have the the Old Testament in front of you? Do you do you look forward to that? Or I know you know some uh, folks don't. <laughs> Um, for me, uh, the Old Testament is challenging, of course. <laughs> uh, of course, it is challenging. But uh, it's full of stories, good stories, that illustrate our predicament, our human predicament. Uh, and how we find ourselves placed as human beings. And what you know of those stories, and we're privileged because, of course, we have the New Testament. <laughs> uh, the disciples didn't. <laughs> they were part of it. They were making it. We have it. So we're privileged to be able to look at the Old Testament in the light of the new uh, and the new dispensation because Christ came to make all things new. So for me, when I read this story, what do I find there? I find there a vulnerable person as we are all vulnerable. She is vulnerable in her own particular way. She longs for something something absolutely fundamental to her identity as a woman. Uh, and she is vulnerable uh, and she is desperate. Now, which one of us has not felt vulnerable and desperate in our time? I certainly have uh, and remain so, frankly, in many, in many ways and in many aspects uh, of, of my life. And, and what happens? Well, you know, she's misunderstood, uh, she's misinterpreted, but what she finds is God's love. And it's, God love, it's God's love and God's love for her that fills her, that fulfills her and enables her to find uh, peace uh, and fulfillment and so i think it's it's a it's a wonderful and and and, and powerful powerful story yes it's certainly uh, a lot happens in just these few verses in terms of uh, hannah's life and uh, i like in verse 18 we're told that she went her way uh, and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Yeah. But I like the fact they told us that she went away and she felt able to eat. She she didn't look sad anymore. Um, well, I mean, she is she's human, and we've yeah. all been there. We've all we've all been there. And she named him Samuel, saying, "Because I asked the Lord for him." Mm. Because I asked the Lord for him. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to put ourselves out there, put ourselves in his hand, and ask. If you were going to be uh, preaching on these texts on, on Sunday, and would you be uh, picking one of them to focus on in particular? Or would you be drawing a thread between them all? Or... What would your approach be if you were in, I mean, you may well be in the pulpit on Sunday, I don't know, but what, what would you be looking to do? I'm in the pulpit on Sunday week. Um, you know, my approach uh, to uh, the lectionary is uh, to uh, read, to read and reread, to have a think, to have a prayer, uh, to read what others have said and commented uh, and then to have a prayer again and to think about it and see what comes. And I think 
and to see what's going, what else is is going on. Uh, and I think at this time, in terms of what else is going on, um, uh, I would be going. I'd be going to the end of days, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't mean that I would necessarily be ignoring. Uh, either Samuel or Hebrews, because you know they all speak uh, to to us. But for me, I think it's discerning the signs uh, of the time, that and and the need to really address what our responsibilities are. Uh, at this time to uh, God's creation, its present, its, its preservation, uh, and our fulfillment, uh, uh, the, the fulfillment uh, of uh, humanity uh, at a time in which there's so much out there that threatens that creation and that undermines uh, our the possibilities for a fulfilled and whole life so i think I, I i'd be going i'd be going for the end for the end of days and discernment and faith and the need to the need to heed the warnings but not to despair because in him there is a way and there will be a way for this just as there was uh, a way uh, for uh, for Hannah so there will be for us but we must heed and we must learn and we must put ourselves in his hand and we must repent we must change which is what repent means we must change uh, and that is the imperative. We've got to change. That is a, a profound challenge on which to uh, finish our podcast, I think. Thank you so much, Paul, for being willing to share with us from the Palace of Westminster, no less. We really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and reflections with us today. My pleasure, David. Take care and God bless. Thank you. And you. And so we finish with... Uh, our blessing of the season. Uh, may the blessing of the God of peace and justice be with us. May the blessing of the Son who weeps the tears of the world's suffering be with us. And may the blessing of the Spirit who inspires us to reconciliation and hope be with us from now and into eternity. Amen. 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 Take Thank care, you, brother. Paul. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. God bless.